going on? Let's do this. Okay. All right, guys. So, this is going to be the seventh episode of the documentary, the Mutant King episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. It's going to be great. And, yeah, just enjoy. Let's do this. Just let me know if it's too loud for you guys or not. So, <laughs> Echo Rex, sure. thank you. I can barely hear it. That's how he makes his living. Just go around I don't even know who this guy is. I think thank you guys, thank you. The, the, um, the hands of time, as of right now, is possibly Mewtwo King. Oh god, M2K. A superficially stereotypical, but then also very interesting person, especially in how it comes out mm. in his play style. Okay, did you guys just see what he was doing? There's a little story for you guys. His play style. And how you see how he's rocking back and forth? Just like that? But yeah, he rocks back and forth, okay? As you guys just saw. So, um, I, uh... I was, I was talking to Mewtwo King, and I was like, yo, Mewtwo King, uh, stop rocking back and forth. And then he's like, dude, I don't know, I just do it out of habit. That's what he said. And then I was just like, okay. And then um, he does it again. I'm like, Mewtwo King, stop wobbling. <laughs> Mewtwo King's like, shut up, to that. And then I'm just like, <laughs> I just laugh at him. But yeah, so anytime that Mewtwo King's rocking back and forth, I'm always like, stop wobbling. He always laughs and tells me to shut up. So, if you ever see Mewtwo King wobbling, you know, quote unquote, you know, rocking back and forth, just tell him to stop wobbling, um, he'll know what it means. <laughs> After all of these years, is able to get, you know, top five. If he Volume up? Okay. an emo and stuff like that, you know. He's, um... Interesting. Yeah, he's very interesting. Melee like control. <laughs> oh. Dude, Brainerd. Oh, do you think you can make a quick announcement before? I, I need you to bring him somewhere else. All right. All right. Uh, all right. A bit weird, but I like him. I'm, I know Ken was ready to play him. He wouldn't. Admit okay, him. that little like incident that Mewtwo King was just in, where he was in the front of the the uh vg boot camp stream oh my gosh i was there for that i watched that it was so hilarious i'm like mutiking how can you how can you be this oblivious like um so Mewtwo King actually stayed at my house uh for like a week or so maybe like two weeks and during that time i would have bi-weeklies at my house and me and him would just team and win every single tournament right and but you know unfortunately i had to house him but to be honest it wasn't that bad yay yes, yes! Yo, shout outs to somebody who just joined Crew Dad. Let me see who that was. Let's see. Looks like Prize Spray. Yo, rejoining Crew Dad. Thanks a lot, dude. Much love, man. Hope you enjoy your stay. Anyways. Um so yeah, like I was saying, so Mitch can stay at my house for a week. And it was great because um I mean, it wasn't as bad as you guys thought, because like with Mewtwo King, I was able, um, I was able to teach him like all of, like you know the normal things that people do, you know, if like because I heard a lot of stories where he would just go into uh, people's fridges and just take their food and stuff like that. He actually did that at my house. I was like, nah, Mewtwo King, you're not doing that here. You can't do that. And <laughs> it was awesome having Mewtwo King around, to be honest. But um. It was interesting. So, Mewtwo King stopped doing that. He would he wouldn't go into my fridge and 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 like you know I tried to teach you as best I could. I mean, out of the out of my house, you know, he did whatever he wanted and he still entered it into other people's fridges and got uh, chocolate milk and stuff. I don't know what he did there, but in my house, I, ta I thought I taught him good. Guess not. But yeah, he w he wasn't able to touch my fridge when he was in my house. Another thing that I taught him was to take a shower every single morning when he got up so every single morning i would wake him up right and i'd bring him a towel and i'd be like Mewtwo king go take a shower and then he's like okay and so every single morning i would do that uh and then like he would complain too of course and he's like dude i don't even stink i like Mewtwo king are you kidding me you freaking stink go take a shower and then he's like okay fine whatever <laughs> 
<laughs> so I would get that guy to take a shower every uh, every single morning. And he actually did it. And I think he's still doing that nowadays. Like, I think I taught him a pretty, really, like, a very valuable life lesson. So, you know, shout out to Mewtwo King for, you know, remembering, you know, all the things I taught him and uh, that I showed him to do. Like, I remember going to a tournament after, like, two or three years. And then uh, I saw him at the tournament. And I was like, yo, Mewtwo King, did you shower? And he's like, yeah, yeah, of course I showered. Of course I showered. <laughs> So yeah, Mewtwo King is now finally taking showers now, guys. So, you know, you guys can thank me for that. Otherwise, you know, he'd be stinking up every single tournament that he goes to. Good thing he doesn't. I don't know. I mean, I haven't smelled him in a really long time. I don't actually go out there to try to smell him. But, yeah, I mean, from what when I've w interacted with him for the past two years, at least, he's been pretty, like, you know, there's no stench there, so that's good. He would act like Mewtwo King's below him. But he was damn scared to play Mewtwo King, I guarantee it. Everyone was scared to play Mewtwo King, because when he's on, you just don't understand how you can possibly beat this guy. Look, when the fuck did this pasty white kid learn how to play basketball? The seven get height. Hold on, guys. Before we get started with episode seven, I just wanted to share another story with you guys. So, back in the day in 2006. Me, Mewtwo King, Cactuar, uh, Kusakusa Kiwi, I don't know if any guys know her, she was a Korean uh, sheep player, and uh, she was a girl, her name was Janet, and uh, it was us three, uh, I'm sorry, us four, and this guy named uh, Moonshine, and then this other guy named Alex Triad, we actually went across the, uh, like, we went to the Midwest, and then we went to New Jersey on a road trip together in a van. It was called, it was at, uh, it was inside Alex Triad's van. They had Smash inside, uh, inside the van. It was freaking amazing. Oh, Video Gamer was there, too, and Video Gamer at the time was dating Kusakusa Kiwi, Janet. And, um, so yeah, it was, it would, it would be us seven, us seven, us eight, uh, um, you know, going to, like, all these tournaments. Like, we went to Evo East together. We went to, uh, FC Diamond together, like, it, it was just an amazing time, like, traveling with Mewtwo King and, like, everybody else, it was just great, it was just really fun, you know, Mewtwo King's a, a blast to hang out with, as long as he doesn't do anything, like, you know, not normal, you know, unhuman, then, you know, he's a blast to hang out with, you just gotta teach him, right, you just gotta tell him what to do, otherwise, he'll think it's normal, he won't know what to do, and don't be shy, you, like, tell him what to do, if he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing, tell him, uh, but yeah, do it out of love, you can't just do it just because you hate him or don't troll him you know that kind of thing you can troll him with you know and when he's rocking back and forth you can say don't wobble but you can um but yeah tell him what to do every time he's like messing up anyways so uh it was just an amazing time uh i just want to share that with you guys uh i don't think i have anything else to say about that congratulations to pc chris he came in at the beginning of the season stunned everyone by beating ken he outlasts everyone else She's 45. The loan stuff we did, it, uh, it went really circuit, well. Which was I didn't sign really anything. Really upsetting for us because that that's part of what creates the hype is being in this environment with hundreds and hundreds of video game players. MLG, they bought Smash Sports. So they they obviously believe in Smash as a competitive game, and like part of it has to do with just um, Nintendo is a pretty reluctant company to work with. You know, through all the years of doing events, I've seen Microsoft and Sony, and they just understand that like competitive gaming's big. It, like it means something for them, and they want to work with you. Like you know, they've tried to help us along and brought developers over. So this guy talking right now, his name is JV Three by Three. I'm not sure if I said this in the first episode or the second episode, but I ended up teaming with him at one of the FC events. Worst mistake of my life. I ended up getting like I didn't even make it out of pools. Um, I was like really really cocky back in the day in teams because I was like so freaking good. For Nintendo's kind of been 
very much the opposite, and where they don't really embrace in competitive communities at all. Um, they're difficult to even get streaming rights. Like we haven't even asked them for like TVs, money, anything. Like just can we show this game that we believe in that you created, stream it for our professional events, and they've been reluctant to even do that. They started 07 Circuit by having a little like grassroots event that they got a venue for. It was a nice venue and everything, but there was no hype. So that was kind of their, their transition was, we can't have you on the pro circuit anymore, but we'll try to help you guys out. So, which was nice of them, but like I said, it just wasn't the same as having it on the pro circuit. It was a really, really big difference. The chance for Smash to grow into something more, something mainstream and professional, seemed lost. In the wake of MLG's decision, the community pressed on, back into the underground world from which it had emerged. A lot of times one champion is replaced by another. Ken was replaced by PC Chris, Korean DJ, and Muji King all at the same time, which is kind of cool that it took three, three people to bring Ken down. It looked like the stage was set for me, Korean DJ, Muji King, just like anyone else who was hungry enough to get up there. The three players wrestled for dominance in Ken's absence. KDJ bested Mewtwo King at the MLG-sponsored Long Island event. Mewtwo King stopped KDJ at Cataclysm 3. In California, PC Chris defeated Mewtwo King at OC3, and Mewtwo King trounced PC at FC Diamond in Indiana. All three were, beyond question, the most fearsome players around. But What the documentary does fail to mention is that I actually took all of these guys out at a tournament called P uh, Pound 2, where that was the most tournaments that's the most amount of people at a tournament there's ever been at the time. I think there was like 200 people or something like that. But yeah, I took them all out, and um, the documentary unfortunately missed that and did not put me in. But it's okay. It's okay. I, I don't really care. I'm just joking. Uh, Korean DJ didn't go, but I still would have beat him. I think. <laughs> the youngest of the trio seemed slightly different. A savant pursuing one thing above everything else: perfection. Unless you're frame perfect, 99 out of 100 times, you're not good enough. That, that's my mindset. That's what I tell myself. That's how I got good. He's so into frames. He's so into the tiny little details. Just thinking about theories and logic and the steps. I'll do like up air and fast forward like the next frame so that I can hit them just barely but they can't hit me, and if the, somehow the upper misses, I get a double jump there and stuff like that. I did that at MLG. I just trained and trained and trained like uh, three hours a day for like two weeks. Everyone makes a joke that to be good, you have to like sit in your basement for hours on end, over and over again, until you finally have an understanding for the game. No one okay. actually does it. So something really, really strange about Mita King is, um, I thought, like, uh, there was one time I went to a tournament and he was sleeping underneath a blanket. I can't do that because I, I get, like, um, you know, claustrophobic. Uh, and so when I saw that and um, I, like, woke him up, I'm like, Mitikin, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm sleeping. And then I'm like, okay, that's weird. Oh, I didn't, like, you don't get claustrophobic because uh, of that? And he's like, no, I've been doing it ever since I was a little kid. And then I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Except for music King. Try to be as perfect as possible, and if there's some area that's not perfect, it's like, how can I make this a little better? Super Doodle Man and Mita King with their frame data on get up attacks, on moves. Yo, yeah, yeah I did. Man, I got out of the loan. Uh, distances on wave dashes and wave lands. I spent like 2,000 hours on that shit, just double checking, triple checking, just to make sure it was as absolutely accurate as I could possibly get it. He's very focused on whatever his objective is, and it can work for and against him a lot of the times. I beat Super Mario Bros. original on NES. I beat it on a spy. I made tons of like, pixel art and stuff back then. That's just something I started once. So it's like, I'm gonna make a big maze. And literally 90% of it, I do line by line, pixel by pixel. Uh, I, I don't know that he's ever ever confirmed you know, where he is on the autistic spectrum, whether he's got a little bit of Asperger's or not. I certainly don't want to make any judgments, but but he's in that vein. He's in that Rain Man world. Muji King can, in fact, recite many, many, many digits of pi, enough so that you have to tell him to stop when he's doing it. Muji King lacks the ability to, to judge social clues. You get him in ridiculous situations sometimes. One time I lost my jacket at a tournament, and I went out to the lobby and I found him sleeping in my jacket, and he didn't realize that it was weird. One time we were in a car together, and we made a joke about, like, 
scared out of the car. And he opened the door and tried to leave while we were driving. And I think he would have done it if we had pulled him back in. He's a complete nutcase. One time we, we went to a Massachusetts tournament and... I'm oh, God. Almost Hold on. I got a story for you guys. So there's one time, right, where we were chilling at this guy's house in Baltimore, Maryland. His name was DK Smash. He had the best house at the time. And... Um, I'm not even sure if it was a DK match house. Anyways, he Mita King got really drunk. Uh, I think MDBA might have introduced Mita King into alcohol, which is a huge, huge mistake. We like we regret it so much. Holy moly! But yeah, Mita King did something really, really dumb. There was a um, there was a second floor to this guy's uh, apartment, and Mita King got really, really drunk and actually uh, jumped off because some girl didn't like him. Or something like that. I'm not. Uh, I'm not t entirely sure, um, but I think this happens a second time. I think uh, Zero mentions this in like one of his stories uh, that he does on YouTube. But yeah, that's what Mita King did. Um, he's crazy. He's crazy when he drinks. Positive. He just didn't understand the concept of paying for something in a store, so he walked into like a gas station and just took like a Mountain Dew and left. And I was like, yeah, I'll just pay for that. <laughs> he might do things that offend people or things like that without knowing it, but he never means harm. There was definitely things he would do that would rub people the wrong way, especially at that point. People really, I think, dismissed him, if not outright disliked him, um, because he, he, I don't think he knew how to really express himself properly. But he wasn't good enough, and you got respect by being good. There was, like, kind of two different camps, people that didn't really understand Me Too King and then people that were like accepting and encouraging for him. And I think that kind of helps. He honestly, back then, all he cared about was Melee. It was all Smash. So yeah. like any relationship. So, Me Too King. Okay, so another story that I have for him is Me Too King, unfortunately, is a uh, little bit money hungry. Um, I think... Uh, that it's very very unfortunate that he became that way and um he often uh like i remember he loaned me like a hundred dollars or something like that it was like 200 bucks he loaned uh he loaned that to me because of a flight that we were need that we needed to take to evo west a long long time ago back in 2006 and he hasn't forgotten and so um what ended up happening was, I think it was like two years ago in, at Bar Wars, he was like, chew that, where's my money, chew that, where's my money? And he often talks about money, like, uh, to me and to everybody else, like, all the time, all the time. Like, you know, people owe me this, um, you know, I deserve I deserve more money, uh, I want more money. So, unfortunately, Mita King's a little bit, uh, like, money hungry, I, I guess I would say. And, uh, you know, I think someone just needs to, like, you know, wake him up, you know, and, uh, get him out of that kind of mindset because it's a very dangerous mindset that's probably why he's balding uh, i mean he, as you can see he's balding right now at the moment he didn't uh, he has hair like right here at least at least i think so <laughs> but um yeah he's currently balding right now i think it has to do a lot with stress a lot of you know with uh performance at tournaments you know if you don't win you don't get money and you bald that's pretty much the cycle and so Mita King will become completely bald as time goes on and um, yeah I think we just need to you know help him out as a community and you know try to get this guy off of money and only and to only think about money because you know it's not healthy for him I don't know maybe he needs to get a girlfriend maybe he needs to hang out with the right people um, you know who knows uh, I don't even know how we can help him because he's living in Arizona right now so you know, I guess good luck to Mita King. We'll figure out something. Um, you know, maybe I'll have a chat with Mita King, see how he's doing. I always try to like keep up with Mita King every sing every single time I see him. And just to make sure that he's doing all right and uh, congratulate him uh, for all the sponsorships that he's been getting and that kind of stuff. Um, basically, just bring positive energy into his life. I, th I think that's what we can do for him. Um, maybe he'll come around. <laughs> if I had with him was only involved playing video games, unfortunately. When he first started playing, he had a very robotic style. He only played by himself for his computer, so he wasn't really exposed to like just normal like play styles. Like, like a thinking opponent, like who daps and like tries to like read you. He's not used to that, so he struggled at first. And I gave him his money back already. No one. worries, guys. He was. He was a scrub. <laughs> you guys do funny though. He wasn't a natural by any means, but he had a work ethic at the time that was unmatched, and for most players, still is unmatched. 
It was, uh, I think, Melee FC 3 or 6. We actually found Mewtwo King 3 in the morning. He was still holding on to his controller, sleeping with it, and he was actually pressing the R and L buttons, like sleepwalking in his sleep. And we couldn't believe it. We thought, we like poked him. He didn't wake up. It's not like he was faking Oh my it. He god. Was, he was dead okay, asleep, okay. But he was just still going at it. Dude. So we thought, this thing, this little picture right here, there's actually a YouTube video of Muji King uh, doing this. I think it's called Muji King uh, playing Smash while sleeping or something like that. If you look it up on YouTube, you'll be able to find it. So um, we were at a tournament in, I think it was like northern, like southern Virginia, like west southern Virginia or something like that. It was at uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. And we went to this, uh, we were staying at my friend's house. His name was Justin. Muji King got the couch. I got the floor. Um... And then Chillin' Dude was there, and this guy named Savage was there. And they, we woke up, we all woke up early. And uh, we saw Mewtwo King. <laughs> Freaking Mewtwo King. He had his controller in his hand while, while he was sleeping. Can you believe that? As you can see, he's sleeping right now with the controller in his hand. And so my friends, Chillin' Dude and Savage, they decided to mess with Mewtwo King. And they're, they were like, Mewtwo King, Mewtwo King, tech Mewtwo King, tech. And then Mewtwo King starts moving his hand on his controller, and he's, like, playing with it. I'm like, and I'm just laughing the whole time, like, oh, my God, are you guys kidding me? Like, this is too, this is just way too funny. Is, is he actually, like, doing this? I couldn't believe it. Like, I thought he was awake. And then, um, you yeah, know, he wakes up, and he's just like, oh, what are you, what, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> so he didn't wake up. It's not like he was faking it. He was, he was dead asleep, but he was just still going at it. They all say it sucks. And then I was like, well, I'll prove you wrong then. That just made me want to prove you wrong. <laughs> you guys are too funny. The next year, I beat Ken in a 3 out of 5 set of Fox. The next year, I had 3 stocks in, in 3 different occasions. In That's a great song. I think Mewtwo King is a wizard at Mega Man 2. He had to fight Wes, raped him. He had to fight PC Chris, destruction. When I saw that Marth, I was like... Okay, so back in the day when it was OC3, I told Mewtwo King, because like his Marth was really, really good at the time, I told Mewtwo King to play Marth and doubles. I teamed with Mewtwo King. And so he played Marth, and he's like, dude, I think I should go Fox. I'm like, no, nah, dude, no, nah, your Marth is really, really good. Just go Marth. And uh, we ended up losing the tournament. We got like third or fourth or something like that. I'm like, dang it. You're right, Music King. You, sh you should win, Fox. <laughs> He's going to be the best player in the world. If I get a hit, I want to take it as far as possible. It works. You know, the best possible method. This is what you do in every scenario. the most fearsome player to know in a match. He just became amazing. <laughs> Unless I'm absolutely perfect, I'm not satisfied. I wasn't around personally to see Ken's reign. Everyone said, you know, it was crazy how much better he was than everyone. Okay, so Mosey Bear has a great question. He says, do you speak to Mewtwo King much now, Chio? So my answer to that question is pretty much not really too much anymore. I mean, like, if I have something to say to him or if I need something, like, you know, a teammate for, like, a huge national event, I'll ask Mewtwo King, and he'll usually help me out. Recently, he hasn't been helping me out that much. He kind of, like, doesn't care, but, like, you know, I'll still talk to him at tournaments. And if I have something important for, uh, you know, for him to hear, then, like, I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, but yeah, Mewtwo King doesn't talk to me that much anymore. But he, me and him, we used to, we used to talk a lot, but uh, not too much anymore. Um, but yeah, we're still cool. But I seen Mewtwo King. Mewtwo King was just so much better than everyone. He just destroyed everybody. It was just crazy. Yeah, Mewtwo King was re relevant back then. Yeah, for sure. I probably. I just rage quit. I said I couldn't do it. People are cleaning up after him. People remind him to bring his coat. They buy him food. They worship him. They used to people give him the time of the day. But now that he's that he's the like god of this game, people will do anything that he wants. The power that he holds by being so excellent you have to respect it. I like proof that a nobody can become number one. 
In melee, Mewtwo King was near perfect. But his obsession. Oh god, was freaking Mewtwo King. Okay, hold on, let me go back to that picture. Okay, freaking Mewtwo King. He's been butchering up my Chudai pose for the past, like, eight years now. Oh my gosh. Like, as you can see, doesn't do it very well. It's supposed to be like this. I mean, it's easy. And, like, he just makes it makes me look so bad just by using that pose. Freaking Mewtwo King. But his obsession was for a game which it seemed would soon be made obsolete. There's one more title I guess I should mention that will turn that fight into an absolute brawl. Oh my gosh. Freaking Brawl was like the hypest thing when it first came out. Oh my gosh. It was like the... Oh. It was it was awesome just to see like all the videos and just to see like, you know, the intro. Like this is pretty much the first thing that we ever saw. And we just wanted to see like more. We wanted to see like where they actually would take the game. And um, yeah, just seeing like, you know, all the leaked videos was... Oh my gosh. It was like overwhelming. It was great. We... And all of us, like everybody in the Smash Community, could not wait to get our hands in Brawl. It was, it looked so, so great. Oh my gosh. I was excited. I mean, you play the game for so long and you're like, you, you just want something, you want something new. Oh, hell yeah. It was like the new game to play. This is going to be the death of Melee. Trust me, it's the best Smash Brothers ever, by far. We drove to this like distant GameStop outside of Philadelphia because it was the only one that was doing a midnight release. We were so hyped, new characters. Melee was so good, so fast, so exciting. You know, it's gonna be part two. We had the fest at my place, in my apartment. We had about four setups. We're playing it. And we're playing it. And we're playing it. It didn't wow me like right off the bat, and I was kind of worried about that. At least from a, at least from a, a more melee perspective. It was so so slow, not what we expected at all. We tried to make it fun, I guess, but after a while, after a few months, it became clear. What that you guys saw just, just is it's the meta game really, of uh, really of brawl. Just rolling player. around, just trying like to hit your for, opponent. Like, oh my gosh, so like it was pretty slow. Match play, whereas it's more like just like who gets. I think you have to like really quest. understand it to that have fun with it. Great, the combo system with hit stun, the various movement options. It had all been lost in translation. A lot of them felt like Brawl was intentionally made to not be a competitive game, which is true. This is going to be a direct shout out to Sakurai, but gaming got to where it is. Okay, so Tall Genter has a great question. He says, how do you feel about Brawl 2? So, personally, I liked Brawl. It wasn't very fun for me in the beginning because I could not find my character. I didn't end up getting good until late October of 2008, and then at that point, um, my skill just kind of like stayed kind of like very very mediocre like I would get seventh at every tournament and um, at all the nationals I would just play seventh every single time and stuff um, I enjoyed it though teams was great I really loved teams it was a uh, it was a different game but definitely it, I remember the times when it was frustrating like when you can't do anything when your only approach is back air with Kirby that's what I did with uh, and brawl then you know it gets kind of boring after a while, but like, you know, with Ice Climbers, you know, you have wave dash into jab. Uh, you can run up and, ja and uh, do a dash attack. You can, uh, uh, you know, fake them out and just uh, wave dash into shield, you know, those kind of things. And But like, and you can also approach with forward air, but in Brawl, it's like really, really slow. You can see everything that's coming towards you that it's really, really easy to predict every single approach. And so the best way to play Brawl was defensively. 
Um, I chose to play it very aggressively, and that's just my style, just because I played melee. But I mean, I uh, so there's frustrating times when I could not approach. Those are the most frustrating points, like when I'm playing against like projectile characters, especially. Those are the most like like uninteresting matches like uh, that I'll ever play. And then there's like matches against Wario. I hated Wario because he would just like jump up, uh, jump up and around, and uh, just wait uh, for you to make a mistake, and then he'll hit you, and then he would just keep jumping up and down, and up and down, and then he'll hit you. That that style of play is like really, really boring. But then, uh, but teams is great. I love teams. I think uh, teams is great. It is today because of its hardcore competitive audience that it was targeted towards ten years ago. And I don't hate on the fact that we and other gaming companies are trying to increase and widen their audience. But at the same time, I feel like Nintendo this time pushed it too far and just, they like cut out their competitive audience. In Sakurai's interviews where he says like, he wants everyone to win, I cannot understand that mind. Okay, so Chinox has another great question. Um, he just says, uh, why didn't you play Icy and Brawl? I actually did play Ice Climbers and Brawl, so th around this time when Mewtwo came, actually became good, um, I guess like the, around this time when Brawl first came out, I entered a tournament. Uh, it was called the GameStop National Tournament. I'll get into that really quick. So there was, there's three local tournaments in your area that you can go to. Um, there was one, let me go ahead and let me see if I can get those trophies. Um, yeah, I'll be right back. Let me get those trophies. Okay. So... The first tournament that you won at the GameStop uh, National Tournament that they had for Brawl when it first came out, you won this trophy right here. So this is the trophy that you won. Let me see if I can uh, give you guys a better picture. Oh yeah, so that's pretty much it. So this is a little wrestling man. This is, uh, this is the first trophy that you win. I won that. And then the second trophy... You have to go to three tournaments, by the way. For every local area, you have to go to three tournaments. The second tournament, you would get something like this. It's a Kung Fu Fighter. That's uh, that's for winning the second tournament. And so you have to win three tournaments at your local area. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to compete in the national tournament. And they'll fly you out to, um, I think it was San Francisco. Gosh, it was so amazing. I got to chill with Isaiah, too, when I was over there. But yeah, so once you win... The third tournament, as you can see, this is a little samurai guy. I won all three tournaments. I got to go to uh, San Francisco. It was a great time. I met up with Isaiah there. I actually housed with Isaiah. He was an amazing, amazing host uh, to me. I really appreciate him. And uh, I competed in the tournament. <clears throat> and so what ended up happening uh, was I was playing Ice Commerce at the time. So at every single one of these tournaments, I would play Ice Commerce. And... The thing that sucked about these tournaments is that we have to use the Wiimote in Nunchuck. That was the worst thing ever that you could use. So, I ended up um, fighting against this, uh, like, Ike player in, like, uh, Winner's Quarters or something like that. There was, there was, it was a single elimination bracket. There was, um, you, you weren't able to uh, play in a loser's bracket. So, I played against this guy named DT. And that, that's what, what his name was. He was playing Ike. I was playing Ice Climbers. I used my Ice Climbers against him. Apparently... Ike does pretty well against Ice Converse. I got destroyed. He barely beats me. I was like, dang it. Like, uh, I started making Johns, like, towards the end. Like, after I lost, I was talking to the announcer guy. And I was just like, dude, dude, can I get another chance? Like, you know, the, the announcers were, like, way too loud. They were in my ear or, like... They were um, like they were distracting me. That's why I told them. Then they were like, no, no, you're done. And another, th another great thing at that GameStop National Tournament is they actually had people there to you know video record you know everybody and they um they went to me to get a lot of footage for them and um yeah i happily accepted and i kind of like you know did some like motions for them and uh i remember while we were, while we were filming i kept doing the chew that pose every single time i had an opportunity like i was overdoing it right and so i did it like a fifth time and then they were like uh, Chudat, do you think you can do another pose? Maybe you can just do something like, 
you know, uh, maybe you can just smile or something or just stand there. And then I was like, oh, okay. So I just smiled and stood there just for the camera. So, <laughs> so that's what they told me. Um, so yeah, I ended up losing that tournament. After that tournament, after I lost that tournament, I dropped Ice Climbers because I didn't think that they were that good. Little did I know that there's an infinite chain grab. But yeah, I did play Ice Climbers. I wasn't very good with them. And I uh, went to Kirby when I found out Kirby was really good. Well, actually, after I dropped Ice Climbers, I tried other characters like Ness because he was kind of melee-like because you can short hop neutral air out of shield kind of like a melee and then there's also i also tried sonic because sonic is a, is a fun character he's a he's a cool looking character first time that we can play sonic in in a smash brothers game you know i had to play him and then i finally was uh after like doing bad at like for like five six months at every single tournament i finally went uh i finally met this guy named gonzo he taught me how to do the gonzo combo which is pretty much with uh with kirby he's got forward throw up air and uh, reverse up tilt, reverse back air. And uh, that sets up for yourself for like a 40% combo. I was like, oh my gosh, there's, there's combos in Brawl? I gotta learn this character. And then I just took Kirby from there. And that's why I started playing Kirby. And then from there, I just played Kirby up until today. That's pretty much it. And that's why I dropped Ice Combers in Brawl. Because melee was so popular and still is because it had the duality of being able to. Booby Snow, a crew that voice, what's up, dude? And as a competitive game. I don't understand the reason for just eliminating half. <laughs> Nevertheless, people still developed a competitive game behind it. There is such a scene for Brawl still because of Melee, and because Melee was so competitive, people wanted to make Brawl just as competitive, and you can, just not, it's not pretty. <laughs> I'd say like summer of that year, not even too long after its release, that's when people, most people started to realize, at least people that had gone to Melee tournaments, that this is not a legit game for tournaments, so. That's about when I stopped. Brawl cleaved the community in two, and seemed to mark the end of the road for some of Melee's elite. Okay, so a little thing about this is, during this time, I think I mentioned it um, in one of the episodes of the documentary that the the actual like dude that was a part of MLG, um, his name is M3D, who was hosting the MLG tournaments, he actually tried to kill off Melee. And um, he was just like, yeah, we got to kill off melee guys. Like we're, we got to go into this new game. Like it's a new thing, and um, that's where all the money's at, I guess. And then, um, but everybody was like, um, they're like, no, dude, are you are you kidding me? Like that's a horrible idea. But that's that's what his decision was, and so he tried to kill it off. And then you know during this time, this is the dark ages of melee. Holy moly! Like after two thousand eight, we only had like thirty man tournaments, and then it, that reduced down to twenty man tournaments. Went down all the way down to ten man tournaments, and that was like once a month or, tw or like once every two months, and that was for melee. Brawl was the ne next best thing, and there was like barely any melee tournaments. It was very sad days, guys. Very very sad. I kind of got into brawl for a little while, and that didn't last very long. <laughs> and I didn't look to melee to go back. I just honestly thought I was going to quit there. I was just like, well, you know, like I had my moment in Melee, like I had fun with it, like I'll still play it, like with my friends, but like it's not going to be a big part of my life anymore. Piece of Chris is a snake and Brawl, college. it's pretty good, it you was beat me. It was incredibly difficult to have the same kind of lifestyle. When Brawl came out too, it was really what set the nail for my hiatus. But for Mewtwo King, Brawl was a chance to keep going with competitive gaming and get a jump on the competition. So I, I just try to get really ahead of the curve so that way I can like make a lot of money and make a name for myself even more and just have fun, just everything. I have fun playing on it because he's fast and I like combos. If he, if he, he feels like the only melee character. I just try to figure out everything really fast. Playing both Brawl and Melee at the same time competitively is very difficult because they're two different games. At some point in 08, I was actually like top number one in both games. After MLG, Melee found a temporary home in the lineup of Evolution, the premier fighting game tournament. In so, Chinox wants to know, why did PC quit? Not entirely too sure. I mean, you know, the documentary pretty much explains that Brawl pretty much killed all of his hype for Melee. And, you know, as I was explaining that, you know, Melee wasn't that popular and N3D was trying to kill off uh, Melee. 
And so there, since there was no ma more uh, melee tournaments and Brawl was a new thing and everybody was going to Brawl tournaments, that's pretty much why PC Crit, uh, Chris quit, I think. And I think he just wanted to focus on work. In the United States, the professional setting and first place prize brought a familiar face out of retirement for one last tournament. Third place was good enough for me. Like, I wanted to go out with a bang. I went, Zero nine. I went first place. I'm pretty sure you're right. <laughs> I Evo, and uh, I trained my ass off. For Mewtwo King, a focused Ken would be the man to beat at Evo. But before he could take him on, he found himself facing off against a melee newcomer and his stubborn Jigglypuff. Oh my gosh. So, oh my gosh, okay, so I gotta talk about Mango really quick, I forgot uh, I forgot about this. Okay, so, I remember when I first met Mango, he was a little kid, he was like 14 years old, and like he would go to all these uh, Ken Bi-Weekly tournaments, and I had no idea who he was, and I was playing him, and uh, I beat him on like two or three Stockton or something like that back back in the day, and then um, Manicloud, Ken's brother, he comes up to me, and he's like, yo, dude, what do you think of that guy? I'm like, uh, he's okay. You know, um, you know, back in the day, I used to beat everybody, so like he, he wasn't like he w wasn't too much of a concern to me. But uh, Man Cloud was just was just like, dude, you know that guy's gonna be really really good, right? I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah, dude, he's gonna be good. Just watch, he's gonna be he's probably gonna be the best in the world or something like that. And I was like, okay, and like I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, Mike, you like this guy's not gonna be good. Like, are you kidding me? But little did I know, freaking Mango becomes the best in the world like right now so I had no freaking idea and I played him at like two tournaments three SoCal terms or something and you know I would beat him every single time and um, I mean eventually he just got really really good you know he just played the game a lot and I guess that's what happens when you play the game a lot so congrats to Mango but yeah it's so surprising I was like so so surprised when he finally get uh, got good was talking to me about like I went to a California tournament and I was like yo who should I watch out for and he's like you don't know who he is but you need to watch out for this guy Mango like he might not beat you but he's getting good and he's improving so fast and he's like he, he's like he's just sick with Jigglypuff like better than anyone you've ever seen with Jigglypuff but I'm like wow okay so Twit311 asks a very, very excellent question. So he wants to know, when did HBox come in? Yeah, I'll go ahead and tell you how HBox came in. So I was going to a, a tournament called the Greatest Melee Tournament Ever. This is what the name of the tournament was. Uh, the Greatest Melee Tournament Ever since Brawl came out. Um, I think that was in like 2000, late 2008, 2009, something like that, maybe 2010. I think it was 2009. Um Man, memories. So I went to that tournament, and um, I, uh, Hungrybox actually went to that tournament as well. And I had to fight him in tournament. I think it was like for like losers quarters or something like that. I mean, I lost to Mewtwo King, or I lost to, like Video Gamer and uh, and winners. But then when I had to fight him, um, like you know, he was uh, like he wasn't too much of a challenge. Like you know, back in the day, because like you know, I didn't even know him. Like it was one of his first tournaments, uh, national tournaments at that. And then uh, when I beat him, he would get like so angry. He would get so so mad. Oh my gosh! Like he threw his controller and everything. Hungry box. Oh, I was like, oh, I like this guy's a joke. Like, are you kidding me? And then you know he played Jigglypuff at the time too, and I never thought he would get good. And um, I think he still has that little habit where he'll get like super frustrated and he'll like throw his controller and stuff. I remember I played him at Zenith 2012. And I ended up beating him, and he was getting, like, super frustrated. Like, I can hear him, you know, while I'm playing him, and I can, like, barely see him in the corner of my eye. That he's getting, like, really, really mad. I'm like, yes, yes, get madder, get madder. The reason I want him to get mad is so, you know, so I can have an easier chance to beat him, right? <laughs> so that's what happened, and um, that's the first time I ever met um, Hungrybox. It was uh, back at that Melee tournament in uh, 2009. Usually when you ask something, they're like, oh, watch out for this guy, blah, blah, blah. Like, he, like, went out of his way to warn me about me. Yeah, like, McWaffle7, I saw it. 200 viewers. Thank you, guys. Well, when Mango came on the scene, I was already on my way out. 
I was already a little too old, and I was already not quite good enough. And <laughs> Kyo, blah, thank blah, you. Blah, blah, blah. So I was able to view it kind of on the outside. He was a hurricane force, and when he beat Mutsu King, everyone said that it was a fluke, including myself. I thought, you know, it was, it was the middle of the night, and he was on West Coast time. And... Okay, so I remember when Mango beat Mutsu King. Like, I talked to Mutsu King, I was like, Mutsu King, what the heck? How'd you lose to Mango? Like, uh, me and Ken beat him all the time in SoCal. And then he's like, dude, he was so stupid. And then he's like, 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 there's only one stock match, uh, uh, one match, uh, per set. Like, it's not even a best two out of three. Like, this is so dumb. Now I have to play in loser bracket and, and, uh, and like, and, like, he got so lucky. And, like, if it was best two out of three, I would have beat him. I'm, like, I'm just like, okay. I'm like, are you kidding me though? You still lost though. And he's like, man, this is so stupid. And he just walks off. So yeah, he was pretty upset that he lost to Mango. That's a Jigglypuff, please, that's not a real character, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I made a lot of excuses, and then Mango continued to win tournaments. Mewtwo King is good at finding, like, the best options for a situation, which can lock him into a bad mindset of being best. Okay, really, really quick. So, I remember at this tournament, Pound 3, me and Chelnu were teaming. We were, like, really, really good at the time. And then we were playing against these two players, new up-and-coming players. They were 12 years old when we first met them. Their names were Hacks, Money, and J-Man. And, like, you know, we are playing them, and they were called the Little Rascals. I'm like, okay, these guys are little kids. Like, there's no way they're going to beat us. Freaking chilling, dude. He like drops the ball and like he just like kills himself and like over and over again. And like, oh my gosh, dude, I have to carry. But I'm like, I think in the back of my head, like, dude, there's no way we're gonna lose to these little kids. And everybody's watching, they're all hyping him up. Chilling, dude, dies. I have to find 2v1. I ended up losing. We ended up losing the whole entire tournament set against them. I think we took it back in losers bracket. But yeah, we ended up losing the freaking hacks and uh, J Man. They were pretty good back in the day. And yeah, we were just surprised. That's the first time we ever met hacks option all the time. Oh Mango knows me to King wants the best option. So he says, you just do stupid things that aren't, that shouldn't work basically. You approach him in weird way. He says, you know, you do weird stuff. He doesn't know what to do. So he's not saying, okay, I'm going to wait for, you know, half a second, then run up and grab you, then up throw you. No, he says, I'm going to wait. And you're going to do this, you're going to roll because I'm forcing my will on you. It's a, very, it's a very typical West Coast player mentality. They're not really interested in dissecting the game so much as they are playing it and learning how to manipulate their opponent really well. Or Mitchie King is just figuring out how to abuse the game as hard as he can. That was a really, really good analogy. Uh, I mean... Um, uh, pretty much a good like dissect mint of the West Coast playstyle and like you know his playstyle and Mitch King's playstyle. That was really really interesting, and uh, that I mean to me that's it's it's true. Like that's what um, I do sometimes too. Like I'll force my will like on people, and that, and so it's kind of interesting to to hear him say that that other people do that too, just because um I didn't know other people did that, and so. I just want to, basically shout outs to Dr. Pee Pee. Smart guy, I had no idea. He's a robot, he's really good, his combos are amazing, but once you get in his head, it's downhill for Mutsu King. Ladies and gentlemen, a Jigglypuff ditto. Cooper checks him, Mango. Uh, so much of Mewtwo King's identity came from being the god at the game. So on comes Mango, his kryptonite. And when Mango beat him in those awful, horrendous, embarrassing Jigglypuff dittos, uh, I think it changed him forever. Um, at least in a smash way, if not in a real, real world kind of way. Uh, Mewtwo King is unable to beat Mango anymore. It's like something broke in his brain and he forever has a mind block where he can't beat him. And it's a shame. And you see just the frustration in losing to him.
He loses one match or two matches and that's it. He's done for the tournament. He can't bounce back from it. He's not like a Ken or a Chuya. He doesn't like the adversity. Yeah, so um, I remember these days when Miji King was losing. I felt so bad for him. I tried to give him as much advice as I could. I was like, dude, you just got to use Marth against him. You just got to outspace him. And then he's like, um, dude, it doesn't work. Like, you know, his back air can beat my forward air. I'm like, are you sure? Like, I'm pretty sure uh, forward air can beat back air. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it won't work, man. And I was like, dang, dude, like, you guys, you just got to bring it back. And, like, that went on for, like, two years. I tried to give him advice. And, um, I mean, he finally beat him at, like, at a tournament in, like, 2012, 2013. Like, five, like five years later or something like that. But, you know, uh, sad days for Music King. Sad days. He doesn't like being cheered against. He doesn't like not understanding what's going on. See you later, John T. And Thanks for watching. There, I really saw frustration and anger in him. It used to be everyone rooted for me to King, and then by the end, people were rooting against him, and then to see him fall to Mango well, is very heartbreaking for me. It's very sad. I have like depression problems. Like when I, when I, when, I, when I'm like not playing good that, uh, in a day or just feeling down for whatever reason, I just like I just get depressed, and then it's, it's a really big problem I have. I just get depressed, and then I just like don't feel like playing anymore. I don't. I mean, I know it's a job, but it's like it's also it's, it's also the truth. Yes, I am smiling. McWaffle seven. <laughs> no one wants to win. It's like I feel like I have no friends. I feel like I feel like I'm the enemy. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just a big pussy. But I mean, what I, I think what I say, what I'm saying is also true. <laughs> I think I actually think it's both. <laughs> I'm smiling during the MTK scene. The sad one. That's funny. Funny. Cool life. Even as we still okay. decide to stick with the melee. So, um, Toy three one one wants to know when did Armada start playing? Actually, I was not a part of that. Um, I only heard about it, and I did. Uh, I, I mean, I was focused on the results. I'm like, who is this Armada kid? He plays Peach, and he's from Europe. Like, he has no chance against the U.S. Uh, so he went. It was at Genesis. Uh, I didn't actually meet him until uh, I think it was Apex 2010. So. And he ended up going to Genesis in, uh, I think it was 2009. Wow, this memories, holy moly. There's a timeline, too. But, yeah. So, he went to Genesis. Not sure what uh, year that was. Pretty sure it was 2009. And um, after I heard that, he, that uh, he beat everybody there, I was like, oh, my gosh. So, like, this kid's really good. I, I'm like, I just thought he got lucky. I didn't think that he was really good. I, I personally thought he got lucky. Ended up meeting him at Apex 2010. At this point, my skill wasn't that great anymore because I didn't go to any more melee tournaments. And I was mainly focused on Brawl. And so, I ended up getting second place in the Brawl Doubles tournament at that tournament, by the way. <laughs> but anyways, so, um, that's when I first met Armada. And I was like, uh, Armada actually approached me. He was just like, hey, Chu, uh, nice to meet you. I'm like, oh, Armada, hey, nice to meet you. He's a very, very, like, European. He had a thick accent, and I was just smiling. Because um, he was friendly. So that's the first time I ever met Armada. It was at Apex 2010. And um, he's a nice guy. I like him. He's cool. I almost did. Numbers were starting to wane. These events used to be, like, 40, 50 people in the tri-state region. You know, starting to dim down, like, 20. And you're really concerned, like, is, is this the end? Melee looked like it was on death throes. And... It's like, you know what, let's just do one more, you know, as a farewell. Right there, okay. AKA Olive Park, ladies and gentlemen. That's the boy. Right and early, man. Right and early. Right and early. I came a little late because, you know, I had the females here setting up. He had the females. Okay, so this tournament right here, ROM Revival of Melee, was the point where I finally realized I started losing my skill. Mango went to this tournament as well. I think this tournament actually happened after Pound 3. And that's when M3D tried to kill off Melee. And uh, Brawl was like really, really popular at the time. I think this happened in 2009, like late 2009 or something like that. And so I went to this tournament thinking that I'd do really, really well. And I went with Azen actually. It was me and Azen. We traveled together to this tournament. And I ended up getting fifth. I lost to Mango. And I don't remember the other person I lost to. Um, Azen also got fifth as well. Well, we didn't. Oh, I lost to the Shizwiz and Mango, unfortunately. And so, and as in, he lost to, I think, the Shizwiz and Kage, or PC Chris and Kage, something like that. And at that point, I was like, okay, 
man, I can't believe I got fifth. I never get fifth. And yeah, I'm probably not that good anymore. So this is kind of like my downfall right here. After this tournament, it was definitely my downfall. I would get top three at every single national tournament. Besides for this one, this is the uh, point of my downfall. Who's interested? And then it just it was a waterfall. You start hearing guys from the south, hungry box, shiz, men, you know, mango, still at Wild with Me Too King. You have this mix of all generations of the game. Guys like Korean DJ, Shootout, PC, teaming with Mango. Me Too King is the bridge between those generations. There was nothing like it. I went from studying these guys in the hub to being there, playing them in front of me and asking them directly. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Okay, so Cool Line wants to know, have I ever gone any top places in Brawl? Unfortunately, not really, not in singles anyways. My best placing was probably 7th at the Clash of Tournaments um, 2000, 2009, I think. Wow, memories, dude. No, I think it was 2010, something like that. It was called the Clash of Tournaments. I went to that tournament at 7th place. But at uh, Apex 2010, I played with Junebug. And we ended up getting second in Brawl Doubles. We destroyed the bracket. Oh my gosh. Like, there was double Meta Knights left and right. We beat every single double Meta Knight team. We beat the one of the top uh, teams in the nation. They were GNS and Razor. We played Diddy Kong and Snake. We beat them. We destroyed them. I, I, I went ham. Uh, so, teams is my thing back in the day. And uh, even still currently. So, that's my, er that's my best placing. Probably that second place in doubles finish um other than that it's just been a bunch of like 14th 17th 30th 3rd and i haven't really made a huge impact in the brawl uh brawl game and in doubles i did good but not too much in singles it's all good at that point in my smash career okay so we got another question another great question so uh Timmy V says, "Hey, uh, Chu, do you, uh, how did you, uh, Mango's Puff play against you?" So Mango's Puff, I mean, the first time I played him, like I said, it was back in SoCal. I played him like two or three times when he would enter our the random locals there, and uh, I beat him. I, I like two stocked him, uh, maybe I probably three stocked him once or something like that, and I didn't think much of him. And then I didn't actually end up playing him until like for serious, like when he got really, really good. It was at pound three, and then at that point, I thought I was going to beat him. He actually beat me. It was 2-1, and a really, really close match. Oh, my gosh. Super, super close. And then after that tournament, I went to ROM. I got really, really close to Jigglypuff again, bringing it down to 2-1. Uh, that, that was a set. It was really, really close. He took me to Brinstar. That mother freaker took me to Brinstar and beat me on Brinstar. I, I hate Brinstar. It's one of Ice Climbers' worst stages. And then at pound four... He took me to, I played him again. It was 2-1. He took me to Brinstar again. I, I did not learn from my mistake. I did not ban Brinstar. I should have learned from my mistake. I probably could have beat him at Pound 4. I, so, yeah. I lost to him at Pound 4. I was really, really close, of course. But, um, yeah. So, and then after that, the next time I played him was last year at, I think it was Skate Hard 3, where I played as Fox and he destroyed me, like, He's practicing so much right now. I barely practice. I'm pra I'm doing I'm doing Project M. I'm doing Smash Four. I'm doing Melee and uh, Brawl still. So um, yeah, I'm not that good at Melee anymore. Unfortunately, I'm still. I really really want to get good just because e the esports like whole uh, scene is really really interesting, and I want to be a part of that. And I want to be like like you know one of those people to bring like the hype you know for the audience as well. I have not felt that feeling in a really really long time. So if I can get that feeling back then I would probably enjoy Melee uh, more. But I, I think that means I have to practice or something like that or just somehow get really, really good. But um, but yeah, that's how I did it against Mango. I kind of had said, okay, I made out a bracket. I can leave this community behind. You know, I can go back to where I started, back to Street Fighter, Virtual Finder. And then match four happened. Without that set, I probably wouldn't be in this chair right now. Oh, 
his would be like a Carl Malone, someone who was extremely solid, might not have won the big one, but people definitely know that name. And MTK at the time was kind of Jordan-esque. I don't know what the hell's happening. Yeah, Shizwiz, uh, if you, um, Shizwiz was a really, really good player at this time, and back in 2006, 2005, 2008, 2009, I guess is when this tournament was. So around th those like three or four years, he was like pretty good. Like he was getting pretty good really, really fast. He became, he was a nobody. And so I have, um, so what happened was I have family in Florida. Uh, they live in Naples. Uh, Shizwiz actually lives kind of near Naples. I think he does live in Naples with his uh, brothers, uh, Smash Mac and Keith Speedin, who are, um, Keith Speedin actually became um, a somebody in, in Florida. Everybody in Florida knows who he is. I'm pretty sure you guys might not know him, but yeah, Keith Speedin was mad good. He was rivaling the Shiz was the skill level, but Shiz was mad, mad, mad good at the time. So my family in Florida would invite me over for, uh, for Christmas every single year. And I would go down there every single year for, uh, for Christmas time. And I would, uh, I would go to uh, random local tournaments. I would, before going to a tournament on Smashwords, I'd be like, "Hey guys, you know, uh, is there a tournament coming uh, coming up soon during Christmas time? I'm coming down to Florida." And then they'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, there's a tournament in Miami. You should come, shoot at." I'm like, "Okay, cool, awesome, I'll go." So I would go down there with my uh, with my cousins and uh, the Shizwiz, Keith Speedin, um, Cobol, and Lamb Chops. Uh, they were all there at that tournament. And uh, I would team him with my cousin, uh, she gets his BM. We have not lost a tournament to any of these guys uh, every single time that we played back when I was teaming with them. But keep in mind, this is like back in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. That was, that was my prime. And these guys were just getting good. And, uh, you know, Shizwiz, um, like, he would take games off of me too back in the day. And he was, like, really, really good. I was, like, so surprised by his skill level. Him and Keith Speed and the other, like, they were, like, mad good. And Cobol. And he almost beat me back in the day, and, and I had to resort to wobbling just to beat him. And everybody was like, boo, boo, cheat out, you suck, you suck, you, you're wobbling, get out of here. And I ended up beating Kobol at, um, at some tournament called, like, the greatest, uh, like, Elliot's Happy Birthday uh, Smash uh, Tournament or something like that. Uh, Elliot's Big House or something, I forgot what it was called. So... Yeah, so I played. So that's when the Shiz was first getting good, and it was pretty interesting to play all of them, um, because now they're like really, really good, and they actually like beat me now. Cold Bowl Shiz waves are mad, really, mad, mad good. Shiz was the one that everyone was screaming for and wanted to see advance. I was a Falco main, and Shiz is just pushing the brink of anything I'd ever seen before. I just remember my doubles partner, Can I Smack, is standing next to me, screaming his lungs out, saying, I don't care anymore, I'm maining Falco after this. But like, a lot of times, he would defeat himself. If the crowd's not behind him, if he's being cheered against, if he suicides. Whoever the fuck said that that, that set in Florida was the best match ever, you were sadly mistaken. It's over. We're going to game five. Shift passes in control. Yeah, I had no idea that the Shiz was had his own like mini episode. I can dominate, I can take over the game at any point I choose to. You make one mistake, that's all it takes because I know how to get rid of you. He pulled victory from the jealous defeat, there's no other ways from saying it. Match 4 became the most watched of all time, and just like that, a community which seemed destined to fade away was revived.
thanks in part to a robot. Yeah, he lost to Mango afterwards, but he was able to recover, where most players just mentally would have been crushed. If I see, you know, Apex 2016, and he gets top three in Melee, top three in Brawl, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think that a lot of people would have gotten to know him, um, possibly because of the social barrier between him and other people. But I think he's made um, real friends that he's been able to hang out with and spend time with and, and make a connection with because he was good at the game, not because he played it, because he was good at it, because there was a difference. You know, he started hanging out with us, you know, we, like, we actually like, got him to drink. And like, I don't know, we just talk, like just to hang out and not play Smash, not talk about Smash. Over the years, I must say that, you know, he's changed for the better. He's always trying to help people with stuff. He had helped me with melee. I mean, if you compare, if you talk to M2K now versus five years ago, I'd say he's way more personable. You know, he he's definitely improved in that respect. So I feel like the Smash community kind of helped him a little bit. You know, in terms of like, if he was playing an online game, he might still be the same. You know, like he might not have that communication like when you're talking, developing real relationships. Like that definitely helps out. Like he's met, he's gotten plenty of friends from Smash that helped him like kind of mold him to the person he is now. The, the real me too. Yeah. The one picture you saw of me, like Mitty King's like. He's just like, such a like, a, I don't even know, know what word he is, but he's just kind of like, you know, that person that like, you know, you don't want to be like, you know, too kind with because of like the things that he does, you know, he'll like take stuff from your fridge and stuff. And like, he's just ridiculous, so like, when we were posing with him, that's, that's why I made that face. <laughs> I got good using gimmicks. There's always been like that little rivalry between the two, and I think it comes down to Puck. He is gonna need to collect himself. Get him on the downer. Go ahead, we get two. How will I react if I win, and how will that feel like if I lose? Oh, so now that's it. The Mango episode is next. Okay. But yeah, I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for joining me for the seventh episode of the documentary. I'm going to go ahead and upload it on YouTube uh, sometime this weekend. It does take some time to render, so I can't upload it immediately. So yeah, just get hyped for that. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys so, so much for watching. I'll be back. I'm going to take a quick break, and then when I get back, we're going to get in some melee matches. I'm going to play some ads for you guys. And uh, yeah, just let me know if you guys want to play. I'll be waiting.